DIK request uh, doc, Dr. Ann uh, Wilson uh, to talk about the significance of robust serverless system uh, and public health laboratories uh, network and, and, and also if you can touch briefly upon the significance of workforce development, but you still have 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Assalamu alaikum, Health Minister, Honourable Health Minister, Secretary, Delegates, uh, Guests, and I would like to say friends, uh, I'm very honoured actually, I'm privileged and thank you very much for inviting me to speak and I bring greetings from the UK Health Security Agency. I see there are some slides so let's, let's take a chance here um, and I'll try and go through them as quickly as I can. I'm going to quickly run through and I'm going to say a little bit about myself and the experience I have and the reason I do that is because I want to establish the credentials. I'm not sitting here as an expert in the sense of academia or literature. I'm sitting here, as Dr. Shafter has said, as someone who's been working in public health practice for, dare I admit, 30 years, and that I have experienced outbreaks, epidemics, pandemics. Then I'm going to talk about what I was asked to talk about, some of the essential attributes for response and pandemic preparedness, and you'll already have heard some of that. Um, then I'm going to say about a little bit of the learning and then I'm going to leave us with a challenge for the rest of the day and into tomorrow. So first of all, medically qualified, worked clinically for 10 years in Africa and in the UK and I then specialised in public health, health protection. So a communicable disease consultant working, as I say, not only in infectious disease response, but also, and it's already been mentioned by uh, my colleague from EMRO, about all hazards, so I was responding to chemical incidents as well. But it was 2016 when I was given the privilege of the invitation, and I see friends in the audience, to come and work in Pakistan with the Ministry of Health, the National Institute, and the provincial governments, specifically on integrated disease surveillance and response, and this was one of our workshops back in 2017. I now head up the whole project for the UKHSA, funded by the Department of Health, and we work not only in Pakistan, but Southeast Asia, there's a small team. We work with Africa CDC, with Ethiopia P Public Health Institute, and with Nigeria and Zambia, and you can see some of the uh, epidemics that we've been supporting them and responding to. So there's a range of experience that I bring to this, these comments from across those areas. So it's about strengthening systems, building capacity and strengthening leadership. So we've also been part of the COVID response, not only in the UK, but here in the countries where our teams were. And of course, we cannot forget the, the pandemic in 2009 and the Ebola outbreak all major significant events that we public health doctors and practitioners and many in the room have responded to. So in terms of what are the essential attributes, I would do no better than to point you in the direction of this report, set up an independent panel set up by WHO and uh, reporting into the Lancet in 2012 where they were recommending transformational change in what we do. So basically we're talking about, and it's already been said, surveillance in terms of an early warning system. It's really, really important to identify that we have a problem early. Then we have to be able to confirm that we have that problem through laboratory systems. But the other point, I would, two points that I've pulled out here are about these partnerships at multiple levels across government and outside government, and also the engagement of the community. So, I don't know about you, but that's not the only initiative and report post-COVID. There are so many initiatives that now come out in the last few years, and don't get me wrong, they're all really, really important, and they're all really, really good initiatives. But I don't know about you, but certainly where I sit, I tend to get a little bit overwhelmed because I'm not quite sure where to start, which to prioritize, and often it's the same few people in each of the countries, all countries who are dealing with these. So what I want to look at in terms of essential attributes is look at it slightly differently. And I want to ask us all to think of the systems that we, you work in at the moment. We think of the mechanisms we have and that we asked ourselves, 
three basic questions. Some people in the room will smile because you know I like three pillars. But these are three questions. If you look at the centre, first of all, in terms, terms of the core, and do we have, what are our early warning systems like? Are they robust enough? Will they do what we need them to do? Then, as already been said, in terms of workforce and capacity, can our systems cope? And finally, this point about coordination and collaboration, and that's where I will finish, and I think it's very important. Let me take some examples and some learning. In terms of early warning systems, I really, really have to congratulate Pakistan I came here in 2016, as I said, specifically asked to support integrated disease surveillance and response. And you have really, really progressed. It, unbelievable the work that has been done, where the system that has been set up is now in over 90% of your districts. Data is flowing to the centre and back out again. There's a lot of work still to do. The data is flowing but there's a lot more needs to be done on the analysis and what it is telling us and how it gets embedded. And we have been fortunate to support, as has WHO and other partners, in helping you design and roll out this system. And of course, in the flooding, you were able to use it in the flooding. In terms of labs, uh, I'll take you to Zambia. I went there three weeks ago to see our team in Zambia. And this is in the Copper Belt. And for the first time in Zambia, at a sub-national level, the public health laboratories have come together. They are talking to each other, they are supporting each other, and they are learning and sharing together. And I know there's been a lot of lab work here, but I just thought I would take you to another country. So in terms of rapid response teams or rapid support, this is from Ethiopia, and basically we have been doing some training in relation to that. In terms of capacity, what, what I want to say is it's not just the specific capacity training in terms of the specialist areas like laboratory diagnostics or the bottom picture is environmental epidemiology. We need to support, and with these documents with WHO and then in testing with WHO, we have been doing a lot of work about competency-based training. So not one-off training and then leaving people on their own, but competency-based training that then there is supervision ongoing. And that is very difficult for all of us because of the turnover of staff. So finally, I wanted to talk about coordination and it's been mentioned quite a few times already in the, in the summit. Do our mechanisms that we have in place adequately communicate effectively so we can collaborate and coordinate together? The strategic plan that's Africa CDC here that has just recently been released that we were involved in in terms of public health emergency operations centres and then of course the WHO multi-sector coordination collaboration, really, really important documents. So have we really embedded those or are they nice documents sitting on a shelf? Our learning from each of these areas has been that we will never have the early warning systems we really, really want. We will never have the capacity we all want and need, and we can say that across many, many countries. But my experience over the years has been that if you have coordination and multi-sector relationships as a priority, you can address whatever comes down the road better than you would if you were not collaborating, coordinating together. So the main thing I've learned in my 30 years of public health practice is that the most commonly forgotten essential attribute of preparedness and response is actually collaboration. We talk about it, we talk about it, we say nice things about it, but do we actually do it the way we need to do it? And also, the most commonly forgotten essential attribute of collaboration is good quality relationships. And I am very, very thankful in the years that we have been here that we've established good, trusted relationships with many people in the room and we can have very detailed conversations because, as one of our ministers said in this statement to the UN, that the pandemic, there were many, many high points of cooperation, but actually many and too many low points of isolationism and we need to make sure that doesn't happen going forward. Our project is all about building relationships of trust. 
and we take our time and we ask the questions of what support was needed and we believe very strongly that this is the key and someone else in the panel has already mentioned it in relationship relationships of trusted quality where you can challenge each other as critical friends and therefore collaborate and go forward together. So finally, I would like to add that it's in the literature as well, a lot has been written. We need to see collaboration as an evolving process. It needs to happen at all levels. It cannot be one-sided. And that we need to participate in joint activities, not just talk about it and have a shared goal. So yes, relationship is important, but it's a process. It's not that we have a collaboration. It's not that we are a collaboration, but it's that we engage in collaboration in an ongoing manner. So these initiatives, we really do need to push forward on them. And hopefully, this, I'm sort of stimulating some ideas and I really want to have more conversations in terms of what do we mean by collaboration today and into tomorrow and beyond. Because I suggest that this summit, and I really congratulate you on pulling this together, Minister, great leadership, and thank you for it, and an opportunity for networking. But I suggest it's a great opportunity that we learn together. We all have to learn from each other. We continue to build the relationships of trust and that we take a deeper approach to collaboration. So that in that way, together we can achieve stronger, more effective global health security to be better prepared for the next pandemic or emergency that will definitely be coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane.